Welcome to CPAC Today in Politics. Coming up, what was the result of the Rolling Thunder protest in Ottawa on the weekend? Freedom March, downtown Ottawa, we are here for unity, peace, love. And people are dancing and waving Canadian flags. Freedom! <laughs> Look at the crowd yourself. What is Canada's next move as the battle in Ukraine continues? We also want to continue to monitor closely how the Russian people are uh, living this illegal invasion despite all the propaganda that Russia is putting out uh, throughout uh, Russia. There are a lot of people with very real questions uh, about what exactly is happening, what decision Putin has made, and having Canadian presences there uh, to listen, to engage, uh, is a good thing. And Conservative leadership hopefuls gear up for the approaching debates. This is still the sort of shadow boxing uh, phase where, you know, you hear the stories, or some, you know, there have been some stories about policies as but again, many of the candidates are, you know, doing limited sort of interviews and limited, uh, you know, putting up limited information about exactly what, what it is they stand for. It's Monday, May 2nd. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Let's get right to the top political stories this morning. I'm joined by Peter Van Dusen, CPAC's executive producer and the host of Primetime Politics. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Mark. Let's start with the Rolling Thunder protests that happened in the nation's capital over the weekend. And, you know, I think there were a lot of interesting elements to this. It, it was obviously not a repeat of what happened in February in Ottawa, and that was the big fear on the part of a lot of Ottawa residents. They wanted the police to manage the situation better, and it seemed to be better managed. Um, and I think there's still the question of exactly what this was about what is it that these demonstrators are seeking because a lot of the mandates that they have been critical of are no longer in place at the moment yeah i think markets become a i mean let's start start with the protest itself if, you know if you're a, if you're in law enforcement in ottawa or you're one of those downtown residents that lived through that uh you know hellish uh, three weeks in january february uh, you looked at this weekend and went you know Wow! Thank God that unfolded the way it did. Uh, you know, and I think it's uh, credit to the uh, you know the police service for the way they prepared for it, the, the messaging they sent out. Uh, you know, they clearly were not going to allow a repeat of what happened uh, the last time. And it's not clear that the group of people, to be fair, the group of people coming to Ottawa, it's not clear that the the majority of them had any intention of causing a repeat. Uh, they talked, you know, they were. They were upset that they were limited in their access to the War Memorial and uh, to the streets around Parliament Hill. But by the same token, um, you know, the you know a little bit of unrest on the on the Friday night with a small group of protesters uh, probably speaks well of the larger group. Uh, the, the, you know, the reasons they came, uh, the way they behaved, and the fact that it it all went you know pretty smoothly from. From every perspective, from the police perspective, uh, bottom line was uh, not you know no no sort of sideways behavior, if I can put it that way, was ever allowed to take hold. So yeah. when, when it started to, they they shut it down quickly, and uh, you know clearly that was a an important way to limit this. But the other thing that's worth talking about is. Uh, you know, you, you, as you mentioned, it's, you know, with so much of the uh, the vaccine, you know, um, anti-freedom measures, if I can put it that way, from the perspective of a, of a protester, have disappeared, have been lifted. Um, you know, so part of the messaging is from them. Uh, I guess we don't want to see it again. We didn't like going through it, and many of them made the point that there are still people who refuse to get vaccinated who uh, have lost their jobs. And, and and protesters who oppose being told they have to get vaccinated to you know enter buildings, go to restaurants, which we saw during the pandemic. So it's become this larger movement, I think, uh, not so much by numbers, but in terms of perspective, it's become not just about vaccinations and COVID, but as you heard many people talk about, Mark, you know, and I think we'll see more of these. It's about freedom, period, freedom. Right. And the pandemic imposed on our freedoms. And please don't try to do that again. It doesn't matter what the issue is. Don't put freedom at risk. That's their perspective. Yeah. All right. Let's turn to Canada's role in the ongoing battle in Ukraine. I think there are people raising questions about what our role is going forward. We've we've obviously uh, put sanctions in place. We've we've supported Ukraine 
with weapons and other technology. Um, but the, there are people saying we should do more and, and perhaps even send some of our political leaders to Ukraine to show solidarity. So what do you think is next as this, as this battle drags on? More questions about Canada's role, uh, clearly. You know, I've talked about this before as well, Mark. We, you know, from the early stages of war and what was the response being asked of of uh, countries around the world, including Canada, and it was for for weaponry, for for sanctions. Um, you know, uh, Canada's done what it could on the on the weapon side, and that's been very limited compared to other uh, allies. We we've, we've talked about that before. We all know why. It's been uh, fairly aggressive on the sanction side, but. There's a symbolic side as well now as the as the pattern of the war settles into this uh, ongoing fighting uh, that doesn't seem to have a sort of clear uh, shelf life for an end date or for, for what's to come next, except that uh, there's continued bombing of uh, certain parts of Ukraine. Ukrainians continue to stand up. The West continues to supply weaponry, and uh, you have a you know, this sort of standoff that continues to unfold. So... Now there's a lot of focus on uh, the symbolism of showing what it means if your country hasn't been defeated by the Russians. And so you've seen you know, over the weekend, the U.S. Uh, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was there. Uh, you know, the, uh, a number of different uh, high U.S. officials have been there. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister hasn't been. No cabinet ministers have been. Uh, other countries, uh, many of them European countries that are much closer to the possibility of retaliation from Russia have begun, you know, reopening embassies, putting their uh, diplomats back on the ground, putting their leaders, presidents and prime ministers have gone to the country, but not so much from Canada. And Canada, you know, Canadian officials, including the foreign affairs minister, keep saying that, you know, the it's in the works for reopening the Canadian embassy in Kiev, but uh, when's that going to happen? Others are moving more quickly than Canada and Ukrainians are noticing. Yeah. All right, let's turn back to Canadian politics at home and, and the Conservative leadership race. There was an event on the weekend where all of the leadership candidates were were together. They, it wasn't a debate. They were each taking turns speaking. But we will have mm-hmm. debates in the next few weeks. And I think a lot of people are looking to those as the next big milestone in this race. There, there have been a lot of events and rallies and a lot of attention paid to the perceived frontrunner, Pierre Poilievre. But... Uh, uh, what what happens next, and what are your observations about this juncture? Well, I think you know it's a it's a long race. Uh, you know, we don't we're not going to have a leader of the party until se- September 10th. Um, so th- this is still the sort of shadow boxing uh, phase where you know you hear uh, the stories are all not you know, the, the stories are some you know there have been some stories about policies as but again many of the candidates are you know, doing limited sort of interviews and limited, uh, you know, putting up limited information about exactly what what it is they stand for. Uh, Pierre Polyev, of course, from the uh, right out of the gate, has been all about really one word, freedom, and the many aspects of that and what that means, and he's got that audience uh, behind him. But uh, a number of the other candidates, uh, Jean Charest and Patrick Brown in particular, have focused their energies sort of behind the scenes, having you know, smaller gatherings, but many of them different parts of the country and really focused on selling memberships. And to be clear, at the end of the day, that's what a conservative leadership race is about. Who can sell the most memberships and get those people to actually vote for you uh, on voting day? Um, So I think we're we're still in that sort of phase where all of these candidates are trying to see exactly, you know, how much support there's likely to be uh, for them, and so I'll be really interested in seeing what happens when we get uh, get the first debate, uh, the September or sorry May uh, May 11th for the English debate, um, and then you know um, the French debate follows that one. And I, so I'm really going to be paying attention because I think those debates will tell us where each of those candidates think they are in the race. Uh, right. What you hear on that stage in terms of the policies they put out. Uh, the attacks they make, uh, the the comments they make about each other and about the issues will give us a really good idea of what's actually happening in their camps, how many memberships they're selling, where they think they are in the race. Uh, you know, and, and, then, and then that becomes, you know, what you want to watch for is who's talking about who, because that's who the other sees as their most important opponent yeah. and who they're being nice to, uh, where they think they might pick up votes along the way. So I think we had, we enter a different phase by the time we get to the debates 
there becomes a different conversation than after the debate, uh, when the dust settles and the, the you know the reviews are in of who did what and how well they did. Then we enter that other phase, which is kind of um, you know really sort of you know wor- working the membership. Uh, putting you know more policy details in the window uh, from there till the time they pick a leader in September. Yeah. All right. Finally, Peter, uh, this is a little bit of inside baseball. Uh, it's about time allocation in the House of Commons. There's been a bit of a debate between the government and the opposition that has sprung up in the last few days over a government motion that would change some of the rules around whether certain sessions of Parliament get extended into the evening, when Parliament wraps up, what bills might pass over the weeks ahead as uh, we approach next month now, since it's early May, the the, uh, conclusion of this session of Parliament uh, as it rises for the summer, likely sometime in June. And there's been all kinds of speculation about what the government's motives are for this, and it's all, of course, also being considered through the lens of this new partnership with the NDP. So what's it all about? Yeah, well, you've covered it pretty well. Uh, it's, 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 you know, for uh, every, you know, people that are that live and breathe this stuff uh, are probably already pretty familiar with how it's going to work. Uh, the people who don't, I think, you know, what's what's interesting to understand here is that this happens every year uh, towards the end of the of the of the spring sitting. Uh, the government pushes for these late night sittings. We're very aware of that at CPAC because it affects everything we do. Yeah. So they, including they, your they, show. They, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite right. So they push for these late night sittings to, you know, get through, um, you know, last minute legislation to try and get it passed before they all break for the summer and come back uh, in the fall. Um, what, what's different about this time is how early they're doing it. Normally that would happen early June for a few weeks at the end of June, uh, through the end of June uh, to get the agenda through. But this is happening early May. And the only reason it's happening is because the government has a a lot of stuff. They're concerned about how slowly legislation is moving. We know that, you know, part of the reason the Democrats talked about the supply and confidence agreement was because they and the liberals complained about delaying tactics from the conservatives. So the reason they're doing this now is pretty simple, Mark, because they can. They, They know that they've got the support of the NDP to make this happen. New Democrats have told me, yep, we'll support this. You know, they're supporting this motion. So they want the same thing. They they want the government legislation, including some of those key things that they've supported, you know, you know, uh, dental care and, and uh, paid sick days. They want those things to make it through this session, this sitting, before they rise for the summer. And so they're on side with this plan to have these late night sittings. It also includes a a clause in this motion that could allow the government to adjourn, you know, adjourn till the fall at any time. Uh, government officials insist that's not their intention, but you have to wonder if it's not the intention, why is it in the motion? So it leaves them that option. Uh, So you could see the possibility of them uh, accelerating the agenda, getting lots of stuff passed, and then maybe even getting out of Ottawa before the scheduled uh, latest possible date, which is the third week of June. They might even get out a week or uh, so early if they get the agenda they want passed with the help of the NDP or with the objections of the Conservatives in the Bloc. It's a procedural tactic. They can do it because they can because the NDP is on side and they're planning to do it. So we'll see how far they go with it. All right. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Always a pleasure, Mark. Take care. That's CPAC's Peter Van Dusen. People are showing love and unity. Freedom March, downtown Ottawa. Now, here's what political columnists and commentators are writing about today in the Ottawa Citizen. Becky Reiner looks back at the Rolling Thunder demonstration. Reiner writes, For a protest promising peace, love, and freedom, I just wasn't feeling it. Lots of people were saying it, but somehow I love you snarled through big mocking smiles. It sounds a whole lot more like, hey, F you. Along with the flag and the word freedom, this movement has co-opted the L word. No surprise there. From the outset, they have been telling us they are doing this for our own good, fighting for our freedoms, reclaiming national monuments on our behalf, going to war against our oppressors because we didn't even realize we are oppressed. Now can you feel the love? In the Toronto Sun, Lori Goldstein argues Doug Ford's path to victory in Ontario is to win over Trudeau voters. Goldstein writes, 
Ford's strategy for winning relies on getting Ontario voters who supported the Liberals in last year's federal election to vote for his progressive conservative candidates now. If he succeeds, it will be in large part because of Trudeau's political and economic support, which would have been inconceivable in 2018. Today, Ford's strategy is based on two realities of Ontario politics. First, that Ontario voters historically prefer that if the federal government is liberal, the provincial government is progressive conservative. And second, that despite their political differences, the federal and provincial governments can work together. In the Toronto Star, Robin Sears asks, where did Canada's famed civility go? Sears writes, Canadians used to be famous, even mocked, for our civility, tolerance, and willingness to compromise. So why are we so frivolously throwing away our social civility? We can blame Americans, social media, too little civics education, and more. More usefully, we might examine why over-the-top insults are so appealing to most of us when directed at a hated target, or why Justin Trudeau knows that when he uses insulting invective to attack his opponents, it's a political plus for him. And then, putting ourselves in the shoes of those under attack, especially the young and the vulnerable, before spitting a slur at someone who offends us. Now, here's what's coming up on today's political agenda. The Prime Minister will attend Eid prayers with members of the Muslim community in the National Capital Region. Later, in Windsor, Ontario, he will make an announcement with Ontario Premier Doug Ford and Innovation Minister François-Philippe Champagne. This evening, the Prime Minister will attend the National Culture Summit Welcome Reception in Ottawa, along with Canadian Heritage Minister Pablo Rodriguez. And International Development Minister Harjit Sajjan will be in Burnaby, British Columbia, to announce details on funding that supports the clean tech ecosystem in British Columbia. And that's CPAC Today in Politics for Monday, May 2nd. Tune in to Primetime Politics tonight on CPAC for coverage of all the day's events. Our podcast returns tomorrow morning. Have a great day.